Hey there, everyone. Thank you for welcoming us to wherever you are today, and it is Resurrection Weekend. Happy Easter! Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 has been our promise leading us up to this uh, amazing worship gathering today, and it is, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. What an amazing promise from the Word of God that by His stripes we are healed. Now, Tanya, today is not just a special day with resurrection, but it's kind of special for us. That's right. 27 years ago, today, we met Jesus, walked that aisle together, and have never looked back. Hey, let me tell you something. It's not just about one day. It's about every day with Jesus walking in the resurrection power, not just one day a year, but walking in the resurrection power. And I want to tell you, we have a layout today that is going to be amazing from worshiping the Lord in song, from all the different transitions to an amazing word from a great friend of ours, Bob Sorge. Man, what an, we are in for a treat. So let's begin this the way we always do. Let's begin with prayer today. So Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for everything that is about to happen. We thank you, Lord, wherever we are today, we are together. Yes. And I thank you that we get to worship you together today in spirit and in truth. Lord, our eyes are upon you. No matter what situation we're in today, no matter where we're at today, our eyes are upon you. So Lord, we pray that everything we do today would give you glory and would give you honor because all the glory belongs to you. All the honor belongs to you. And Lord, today we celebrate the resurrection power of Jesus. Jesus. Yes. And it's in your name. Amen. Come on, Amen. guys. Let's get ready to get into it. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Now revealed. to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus didn't want heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing comes this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Oh, what a wonderful name. Nothing can hold you down, Lord. You hold the victory, Jesus. Come on, sing this. Death could not hold you. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. you silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are rolling. The praise of your glory for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. 
nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. And you have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory. Hello, THP Online community. Thank you for inviting us into your space today. Also, happy Easter. Today is the day that we recognize that Jesus rose. He didn't just die for our sins, but he got back up. How awesome is that? Don't forget to say hi to our moderators because they are so ready and waiting to talk to you. Don't forget that later this week we will be having a blog version of our the message today, as well as a Spanish audio version of the blog for all of our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters. If you would like to be more connected to our THP family than just these online gatherings, I need you to email Pastor Matt. His email is real simple, matt at thpshreveport.com. You email him, he will get you hooked up with a small group where they can interact with you, talk to you directly, get a little more personal than we are able to do here in these gatherings. Don't forget to stick around to the end of the message because we will be having another time of worship and we love to worship with you. Now, all of that being said, grab your Bible, grab your notebook and let's worship God together. Thank you so much for taking time to be part of our online worship gathering today. This is a special Sunday for us here at The Healing Place. First off, because it's the first Sunday of the month. We believe in giving God our very best at the very first. Part of that is in our tithe and our offering. If you'd like to partner with The Healing Place through tithe and offering, we have a variety of ways that you guys can give right here online or text to give. But also, what's special about today is this is what we call BGMC Sunday where we help to raise funds for some very special individuals in Moldova. Each month, our kids and families raise funds for a ministry called The Orphan's Hands, which is literally rescuing children off the streets in Moldova. They are helping these kids discover hope, to discover peace, and to discover the purpose that God has for them. Their main motto, the thing that they teach these kids and they teach everyone they come in contact with is simply this. If you are born, you have a purpose. Over the years, they have rescued countless kids from abusive situations, from hopeless situations and given them purpose to the point that some of these kids that they've helped to find loving homes have grown up, developed their own loving families and have returned to the ministry to rescue more kids from the streets. If you would like to partner with us to help bless this ministry, if you would like to go by giving, again, you can give online, thpshreveport.com. You can mail in an offering to 8957 Kingston Road, Shreveport, Louisiana, zip code 71118, or you can text to give at 318-225-7339. Thank you so much for partnering with us here at The Healing Place to let children know that they are loved. Hey there, everybody. What an incredible time we've had already. And now we are about to take a deep dive. Listen, you're about to hear from a really dear friend of mine. 
And before we get to him, I want to just give you a couple of instructions that may help you as we kind of process this message today. This message is in a series of teachings from Bob that you can catch on YouTube, but this has specifically been chosen for us today on Resurrection Sunday. Bob's story is a little bit different. You're going to need to probably turn it up. His voice is very, very low, and it's not because he wants to do that. It's because he has to do that. Many, many, many years ago, uh, Bob had an issue with his throat. He was a worship leader. He was a singer. Uh, he was a really world-renowned worship leader, and he began to have issues with his voice. And sure enough, the issue became worse and worse, and surgery didn't take care of it. And so for all these years, he's been almost at a whisper. He communicates a lot with people uh, by writing things down in a notebook. He always has a notebook with him. Uh, so that he can have this much of a voice to share with us. And it's incredible to me that Bob Sorge was a worship leader, but some of his greatest books written on worship were written after he lost his voice. And I want to tell you, there could be no better person to bring us this message today than Bob. So be attentive, maybe turn your volume up a little bit, and uh, let's take a deep dive into the resurrection of Jesus today. In this series, we've been looking at the cross of Christ, and I want to conclude by looking at the resurrection as the confirmation of the cross, because the story is just not complete with the cross only. You've got to have the cross and the resurrection together for the whole story to be complete. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. There are parts of the story that just don't make sense apart from resurrection. Resurrection is the only way to explain some of, some of the things that uh, took place. For example, the cross did not kill the Jesus movement. It's crazy. Everybody knows, kill the leader, you kill the movement. And when they killed this leader, instead of the movement dying, it erupted with explosive energy, even greater than when the leader was alive. And, and, and we're just like, how do you account for the movement not being killed by crucifixion? Crucifixion was designed for such a thing as this, to kill the whole movement. And yet it erupted. The only explanation, the leader actually rose again. When you kill our leader and then God raises him from the dead, it just puts chutzpah into all of his disciples. And now with boldness, we declare and, and, and preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Something else that doesn't make sense without resurrection. The disciples were suddenly willing to die for Jesus. How to explain this? They were not willing to die for Jesus when he was alive. When they came and arrested Jesus, they all vamoosed, they ran, and uh, Peter denied Jesus. So th they weren't willing to die with him when he was alive. Now that he's dead, they're willing to die for him. How do we explain this? There's only one possible answer. Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. His disciples knew it. They saw him, and with boldness and confidence now, they were willing to lay their lives down for their resurrected Savior. I just want to say it here in this last session of our series on the cross. Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead. He is living right now. He is with you right now as you are watching this film stop and you'll feel his presence with you he's with you right now loving on you right now 
everybody saw the crucifixion. Nobody saw the resurrection. All they saw were signs of resurrection. They saw the empty tomb. They saw the angel roll back the stone. But nobody actually saw the resurrection itself. Crucifixion, very public. Resurrection, extremely private. There were only three persons that saw the resurrection. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was a very private, by invitation only, event where three persons did something very personal. And the Father was like, I don't want anybody else sharing this moment, Jesus. This is between you and me. You see, the cross had, be, had been very personal for Jesus. He's going, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus took that very personally. But now at resurrection, the Father is going, I want to show you how personal this is for me. At crucifixion, he makes it personal for you. At resurrection, he shows just how personal the whole thing has been for him. Resurrection is personal. And at the resurrection, the Father was making a statement. Romans 1 verse 4 says this. Declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So Romans 1 verse 4 says that at the resurrection, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God. The Greek word there is interesting. It's a very colorful word that means uh, that God got out his heavenly highlighter. He marked out. That's what the word means to mark out. And he got his highlighter and he it's like the father at the resurrection is with his highlighter circling around his son Jesus Christ in with with with, with dark lines, with strong lines to declare to the whole creation this one this one is my son. And at resurrection, the father is going, this one is my son. And he's declaring Jesus Christ to be his son at the resurrection. So resurrection is a statement. It's God using a megaphone to announce to the whole world that Jesus is his son. And in fact, he even used an earthquake to underscore it. So dramatic. Resurrection was the father endorsing what the son had accomplished on the cross. On that wooden tree, the carpenter went to work to craft our salvation. And after the cross, the father visits the construction site. Let's see what the carpenter built here. And he gave his approval and he said yes. He stamped his imprimatur upon the crucifixion and said it's sufficient. It meets my standards. Son, you did it. And at resurrection, the Father is placing his endorsement on the cross and saying, I'm satisfied with what the Son did on his cross. The Father didn't resurrect Jesus to get him out of a pickle. The Father resurrected Jesus because he had fully and satisfactorily completed his assignment on the cross. Resurrection made available to us everything that was purchased on the cross. 
Now, what I'm about to share with you now is one of the things God has given me from the Word that is so important to me that I just have to share it with you before we finish with this series. At the resurrection, everything that Jesus labored to achieve and to accomplish was made available to us. Here's the verse that I want to give you. I want to take you to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 17. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. This is a stunning statement from Paul. He said, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. In other words, the cross was not enough. You might be a little surprised that I would say that in a nine-part series on the cross, but I'm going to say it again. The cross was not enough. There also had to be a resurrection. It's not complete without resurrection. And if Jesus had done the cross, but there had been no resurrection, Paul says, he would still be in your sins. Think about this. If Jesus had labored on the cross and had in the agony, if he had endured six hours of agony, if he had taken in his stripes the payment for our healing, if he had absorbed the crown of thorns and become a curse for us so that we could not be cursed, if he had taken nails in his hands, in his feet, <clears throat> If he had shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, if he had borne the chastisement for our peace, for our griefs, for our sorrows, for our iniquities, if he had endured to the end and cried out, It is finished. If the Father had been satisfied with the labor of his soul, and if he had died and descended to hell and gone through all all of that, but then not resurrected, none of it would be ours. Everything he purchased, we wouldn't see a penny of it. Everything he labored to achieve, we wouldn't touch it. None of it would be available to us if he was still in the clutches of death. Resurrection made available to us everything that Jesus labored and fought for on the cross. Here's my point. The resurrection was absolutely essential to the story, critical for our salvation. Without resurrection, we have no healing, we have no salvation, we have no forgiveness. Everything that he fought for, everything he labored for is of no value, of no avail. But if he is resurrected, now everything that he has purchased becomes ours. I think of the resurrection kind of like a cosmic circuit breaker. You had all this provision in the cross that had been purchased by Christ, labored for it. He purchased it all. He purchased our forgiveness, our redemption, our salvation. But until resurrection, none of it touched our lives. And when Jesus Christ was resurrected on the third day, it's like a circuit breaker. It's like the power switch. The, the power was now able to pass. And now the circuit is closed like a, like a big switch being flipped. Now the power of the cross flows to us and we are recipients of everything that was purchased on the cross without resurrection. The cross would have been like a dud bomb that 
never went off, never exploded. But with resurrection, explosion, now the circuit is complete. All the power of the cross now comes to this planet. We're saved. We're redeemed. We're given a place in the heart of God. We are co-heirs with Christ, partners with him forever, because resurrection made it available to us. This principle, my friends, is also true for our lives, that when we're in a trial and we're laboring for things in the kingdom of God, if we're not raised up, everything we're fighting for in our crucifixion will be lost. It will not become available to the body of Christ. The thing that closes the circuit and makes it available to the body of Christ is resurrection. When you're in your crucifixion, when you're in your trial, you're laboring, and you are laboring for many things. There are many things you are gaining in your trial. God's changing you. The transformation in your character, the Christ-likeness, the gold that you're buying in the fire. It's fantastic. He's deepening your understanding of his ways and his purposes. You're coming to know his word and his voice in profound ways like you never did before. Your intimacy with Christ is becoming stronger than ever. Your knowledge in the word, he's giving you a message for a generation. You're going to feed the body of Christ. All of these things are the things, these are some of the things that God is giving you in your crucifixion. He's enriching you. You are laboring. You're accomplishing something. You're laboring. You're fighting for something. And the richness of it is very strong. But if you're not raised up, if your story ends in affliction, if your story ends in crucifixion and death, and you're not raised up, Everything you've been fighting to gain in your crucifixion, it it, it just won't touch the body of Christ. It, It will not minister. It'll fall limp. It'll be powerless. Paul used the word futile. It's possible for everything you have labored for in your trial to be rendered futile, powerless, almost meaningless, if you're not raised up. But if you are raised up, if resurrection power flows into your life and God brings you through to resurrection, then everything you have fought for in your trial now ministers life to the body of Christ. Here's what I'm saying. It's not enough that you're in a very hard trial. Not enough that the fires are hot. God wants you to come through to resurrection. Never relent until you're raised up. Lay hold of faith. Lay hold of promise. Endure in your trial because it's never finished until you're raised up. Crucifixion was never intended to be your last chapter. The crucifixion of Christ was never intended by the Father to be the last chapter. It was always meant to culminate in resurrection. And the same is true for you. Your resurrection is absolutely essential. Don't relax on this. Never let it go. Never let go of his promise. He's done some great things in you in your trial. Hold out for resurrection so that everything that you have labored for in your trial will become available to the body of Christ. The stakes in in this are huge. This is why hell fights your resurrection. Hell does not fight your crucifixion. In fact, hell will even help it along. Hell will add a few logs to the fire. Hell wants to see your crucifixion. 
but hell will resist your resurrection. Because if you are raised up out of your pit, now your story will empower a generation. An entire generation will be shaped, strengthened, equipped, enabled. Your story will go viral and Everyone will gain courage because of the depth of your trial. They're going to look at your trial, and now it's going to empower them in their trial. Because Why? Because you were resurrected. If you're not resurrected, then the story's not complete, and it doesn't compel anyone. But if you're resurrected, the story will be complete. It will compel a generation. The stakes are enormous in your trial. And I'm going to speak in the Holy Spirit to where you're living right now. You are fighting and contending for resurrection. And I just want to say, never let go until he raises you up and finishes your story that it might feed a generation. I see this principle everywhere in the Bible. The compelling stories in the Bible that feed us, strengthen us, encourage us, are stories of people that went through a profound death that ended in resurrection. It had to be the whole thing for it to make the Bible. Because if you just had a if you just had a, a, a crucifixion but no resurrection, well the Bible doesn't really put you in there because it's not a complete story and it's not going to empower anybody. The stories in the Bible without fail are stories of great angst, great trouble where God brings them through to resurrection. Uh, some examples of this. <clears throat> I'm thinking right now of three three women in the Bible that were barren. Sarah, Hannah, and Elizabeth. Barrenness. Now this is an agonizing crucifixion. It's a death to self. It's it, it's it's it, it's heartbreak. You, you talk about uh, about losing heart. You talk about grief and sorrow. These women experienced it because they were barren, heartsick for a baby. And in all three stories, Sarah, Hannah, and Elizabeth, the story ends in resurrection. We wouldn't even have gotten Hannah's story if there had been no resurrection. The thing that empowers their lives for us, they came through all the way to resurrection. And now Hannah's barrenness strengthens many who are actually barren, some physically barren. Actually, women that can't bear children now look to Hannah, Sarah, and Elizabeth for a courage. But there's many kinds of barrenness that afflict God's people. And if you're in a season of barrenness now, the stories of Sarah, Hannah, and Elizabeth strengthen and empower us. Why? Because they didn't only experience barrenness, they experienced healing and fruitfulness. They, all three of them, gave birth to a boy. Similar dynamic with Joseph. What if Joseph had died in prison? What if he had endured the, 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 all the angst of slavery, all the horror of prison, and then died in prison? You and I would have never heard of him. The reason we have Joseph's story today is, yes, he did prison, but he also did resurrection, and God raised him out of that prison and set him in the palace. David, what if David had stayed in Ziklag? What if David had been overwhelmed by all 
the sorrow and the rejection and had never entered into the kingdom, had never become king of Israel? What if he had never been raised up? We probably would have never heard of him. It was his resurrection that released to us the power of his story. And now all of us look at his wilderness years running for his life, hiding in caves and in forests uh, and, and being chased down for his life. His story empowers us because he was raised up. What if Job had never been healed and raised up by God? We would have no book of Job. We have never heard of this man, even though he had all the boils and had all the trauma and had all the difficulty and labored in his soul, went through the whole thing. If he had never been healed, if he had never been raised up by God, we would not have even known of this man. We would not have a book of Job. Resurrection validated his journey and like a huge circuit breaker made available to us everything that Job was fighting for in his trial. Resurrection validates the journey and makes it all available to us so that now people can look at your life and go, oh, that's how God does it. And now they're encouraged and strengthened in their faith to walk with God and to stay in the journey with him. <clears throat> God calls us, Jesus calls us, sons of resurrection. You've got resurrection in your DNA, my friend. Never let go until Jesus resurrects you and finishes your story. So if you're in a fiery trial, and you have not yet been raised up by God, I want to encourage you with one final thought. Crucifixion is the power phase of your story. When you're in a season of crucifixion, this is actually, you're actually in your power alley because the power part of the story is in the crucifixion. That's where the power of the Lamb's story is to be found. When you want to find the power of the story, go to the cross. The, cr the resurrection made that power available to us, but the cross is the power part of the plot. So here's what this means for you. Right now, you're in a fiery trial. While you're in this fiery trial, think of it like this. You, God, is writing the most powerful part of your story right now. This is the part of your journey they're going to be talking about for years. This is the part of your story they're going to be remembering for years. If there's no plot, there's no story. Boring plot, boring story. God's a good author, and he's crafting a plot with your life. You are right now in the power portion of your story. The history that you're growing in God right now is one day going to constitute the power of your story. All the suspense, all the drama, all the intrigue, all the mystery, all the nail-biting thrills, it's all in the depths of your valley. It's all in the crucible of your cup. It's all in the the extremity of your crucifixion. This is where the suspense is being written. After you're raised up, they're actually not going to be talking that much about your exaltation. They're going to be talking about your crucifixion. When the story is finished and complete, it's the crucifixion part of your story that rivets a generation. Resurrection becomes the backdrop against which the jewel of your story will shine. And now your, your prison, your barrenness, your trial, your trial,
rubble will become a glistening jewel against the backdrop of your resurrection, and a generation will gain comfort and encouragement because not only did you suffer a a great crucifixion, you experienced an atomic resurrection. When we tell the stories of Bible characters, the part of the story we talk about is we don't really look that much at their resurrection. We talk more about their crucifixion. Uh, For example, Job. When I say the name Job to you, you don't immediately think, oh, the the guy that got healed, the guy that got double his wealth back, the guy that lived over 200 years, the guy that had this, he wrote the first book of the Bible, he had this fantastic legacy. What you think about is, Boils, the guy that 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 endured a horrific, his ten children taken from him, his friends accusing him, this horrific dark tunnel. That's what you think of when you think of Job, because. His resurrection made all of that available. His crucifixion was the power part of his story. Same for Joseph. When you think about Joseph, your first association isn't, oh, the guy that sat in the palace, the guy that was number two man on the planet, he fed nations. That's not your first thought. Your first thought when you think Joseph is, the guy that his brothers tried to kill. They threw him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. He was 10 years in a, in a horrific, stinky Egyptian cell. It's the crucifixion of the man that you're thinking about because that's the compelling part of the story. That's where the plot is being written. Same thing for Hannah. If I say Hannah to you, you're not thinking mother of Samuel. You're thinking barrenness because it's in her barrenness that the power part of her story is being written. Same is true for you. When you're in your trial right now, if you're in a trial, you're not raised up yet by God. This is the power part of your story. Give God some material to work with. Let him write a good plot right now. Endure, love, believe, hold to promise, stay in faith, because when he raises you up, everything you're fighting for right now is going to become available to the body of Christ, and a generation will be transformed. You're like... Okay, I want to change my generation. I want the power of God to flow through my life and grip a generation. Uh, do I have to go through a crucifixion to get there? To get there? I mean, is there another way? My friends, I do not know another way to get to resurrection other than death. I don't know any other pathway to resurrection than crucifixion. If you want a story that shakes a generation, it will mean crucifixion and resurrection. Why does God do it like this? Well, for one reason. He's the king of drama. He's just into the drama of the thing. He wants to get glory to his name. He wants the name of Jesus to be lifted high in the earth as the great healer, the great deliverer, the great savior of all mankind. And he will take you through a horrific crucifixion so that he can raise you up to the glory of the name of Jesus that the Father may be exalted in all the earth. There's a scripture that goes, this is Psalm 72, 18. It says, he only does wondrous things. So if God's doing something, it's wondrous. That's all he he does. He only does 
wondrous, amazing, miracle things. He's the king of drama, and he does wondrous things with your life. So if the story is boring, he didn't write it. If it's wondrous, now he's the author of that kind of story, because this is our God who takes his people through difficult crucifixions so that he might lift them up in resurrection power to strengthen an entire generation with their testimony. Never relent until he raises you up. Heavenly Father, I'm asking for the friends watching this final film of this nine-part series. I'm asking, Lord, for my friends watching this right now, that you would put strength into their spirit to endure all the way through this crucifixion. This is the power part of their story. May they lay hold of your heart, your promise, your grace. Jesus, raise them up, I pray. May the resurrection power of God fill you now. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be delivered in Jesus' name. That financial miracle be yours today in Jesus' name. May the Lord Jesus heal that relationship. Bring your family together. Return the heart of your husband to Jesus Christ. May there be healing, reconciliation, wholeness. May resurrection life come to your family and to your story so that Jesus might be glorified and a generation edified through your story. I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for letting me talk about the cross. This has been a fantastic series. I've been It's been my love language. I just can't imagine anything more beautiful, glorious, or delightful than to talk about the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to say to every preacher hearing my words right now, Let's put the cross back at the center of our preaching. I want to say to every worship leader hearing my voice right now, put the cross back at the center of our worship services. Every songwriter hearing me right now, let's put the cross back into our songs. Weave and write. There are thousands of songs about the cross yet to be written. The best songs about the cross are are going to be written in the 2020s. Write them. Give them to us. May the Lord strengthen your heart, give you a vision for the cross. Abba, may the cross of Jesus be lifted up in this day, in this generation, that all men would be drawn to Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Wow. What an incredible message. Now, you may have noticed, if you've been with us from the beginning of this to the end, you may have noticed a gradual kind of descent, maybe, from full-on color to maybe diminishing a little bit, diminishing, diminishing, diminishing all throughout until we were full-on black and white, and now it's like, poof. So hopefully you didn't change your tint or your color or anything like that, but that was on purpose. And why did we do that? Well, we did that to give a visual to what was being talked about. Because when we talk about resurrection, we talk about resurrection weekend, we think yellows and you know greens and all these bright colors. But in the midst of the true resurrection, you have to have the cross. And that was a dark moment. That was a dark time. And here's what that says to us as well, is that in the dark moments of our life, God comes and all of a sudden everything doesn't become bright. There has to be a dark time. And in that dark time, God comes and he brings his light. And in that then, resurrection. Those things that were dead are now alive. And now we have this full color. So I hope that that was a really cool visual for you in even taking the message even deeper than just hearing it today, but also seeing it. So Bob prayed an amazing prayer. If you prayed with him, if you accepted Christ today, if you took your next step in growing in Jesus and maybe saying, you know what, man, there were some dead things in my life and I need God to resurrect those things, then I want to encourage you to take your next step. We're all about next steps here. When we say next steps, we're not just talking about a cool little tagline. We're talking about going a little bit deeper, 
moving, making a movement, right? So we want you to contact us. Let us know. Mediahub at thpshreport.com. If you have received Christ and you need to know your next step, maybe you've taken a deeper dive and you need your next step. Maybe you're in our area and you're like, hey, man, I took my next step and now I think my next step is water baptism. Let us know that so that we can help you take your next step, whether it's online or on campus. We want to help you take your next step to grow in Jesus. And so again, you guys have prayed. We've worshiped. It's been amazing. What an amazing resurrection uh, time that we have had together today. Hey, I love you guys. We appreciate you so, so very much and enjoy the rest of your day or whenever you may watch this. Enjoy the rest of your time today. God bless you.